This episode was pre-recorded as part of a live continuing education webinar. On-demand CEUs are still available for this presentation through all CEUs. Register at allceus.com slash counselor toolbox. All righty then. So now that we've had our daily dose of amusement, we will pick that back up because that is actually an hour video um, on the next installment of class. But for today, uh, welcome everybody. I know personality disorders is, you know, not one of those things that we really generally talk about and it's not super exciting. Um, however, it turns out that approximately 15% of the people in the United States qualify as having a personality disorder. So when we're looking at different diagnoses this and providing that comprehensive treatment, this is something that we may want to consider looking at. Um, now you can argue if it's a long-standing issue um, that that's going to be something that you have to address when you're addressing depression or anxiety or anything else um, but in any event just to make sure we get accurate diagnosis we're going to look at some common errors because i find that personality disorder um, actually especially borderline personality disorder seems to be over diagnosed when you look at the prevalence versus what i've seen um, show up in clinic, um, I, I think it's getting overdiagnosed, but we'll just take a look. So we're briefly going to look at all of the personality disorders and identify eight common errors. I couldn't come up with 10, um, partly because we don't diagnose personality disorders all that much, um, <clears throat> or when we do, we overdiagnose. but it seems like it's one or the other. People either diagnose them all the time or they don't even go near it. And, you know, since we're not doing the five-axis diagnosis anymore, it's even easier to just kind of skip that because, you know, it used to be kind of a glaring issue if you didn't have an axis too. So, overviews of personality disorders, just to kind of hit the highlights. It's an enduring pattern of inner experience and behavior that deviates markedly from cultural expectations. That's going to be an important point. Deviates markedly from cultural expectations in two or more areas cognition affect interpersonal function or impulse control the behavior is inflexible and pervasive and can be traced back to adolescence or early adulthood a lot of times people think of uh, personality disorders as having to have started way back in childhood and really the only one that has a super early onset thing that we look for is antisocial the rest of them if we can trace it back to early ad adolescence or early adulthood or adolescence we're really still looking at a personality disorder and um, we want to make sure it's not better explained as a manifestation or consequence of another mental disorder attributable to medical conditions or substances so we're going to be ruling out things like mania addictive disorders autism spectrum disorders and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and the dsm-5 calls uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder something a little bit different we'll get to it in a minute but that's what they're talking about a diagnosis in somewhat of a personality disorder in someone under 18 requires a duration of at least a year so this pervasive pattern of inflexible behavior that's causing impairment in functioning and or distress has to have gone on for at least a year in someone under 18 and for more than a year in somebody over 18 <clears throat> pardon me and a lot of times if people are struggling they're going to present before this so what's my point my point is if somebody presents and they are you know young and they're having some of these issues but they don't meet the duration criteria this is something we want to look at as an ongoing sort of diagnosis um, and you can well anyway adopted uh, as a as well as biological children have similar chances of developing personality disorders which indicate the influence of environment so this is really important um, you know going back to how I said I think borderline personality disorder tends to be overdiagnosed. Um, when we look back at the childhood history of people with borderline personality disorder, for example, they tend to have a high level of trauma and a high level of adverse childhood experiences really early on. Um, so one of the things that I encourage you to do and I encourage my supervisees and, and staff to do is when you're looking at the 
criteria, when you're looking at the symptoms of a personality disorder, for every symptom, ask yourself, how is this functional or how was this functional in the past for a person? You know, it may not still be functional and helpful. However, it's an enduring pattern. They don't have anything to replace it. It was something that they learned, they developed to survive maybe when they were, you know, in their teens or even younger. And now, you know, it, it's causing problems because as an adult, we expect them to react differently than we expect an adolescent to. So one of the things that as clinicians we can do is help provide them with developmentally appropriate tools to handle the stress that they're dealing with. So we're going to hit the issues first, then we're going to review the personality disorders. I went back and forth about which one to do first, um, but this is what I settled on. So one of the first mistakes that is, are often made in the diagnosis of personality disorders is confusing problems with acculturation. We need to take into account the individual's cultural background, and maybe they haven't acculturated to our um, our, our culture if and this can be they were moving from r really rural to really urban maybe they are um, uh, moving from somewhere where they didn't have um, the same sorts of luxuries that we have they, they're moving from a country where they didn't have as much industrialization or you know there's a lot of different things we need to look at or they could be moving or they could be from a culture that has a whole different set of expectations for social behaviors so we want to you know kind of back up and take a look at that now culture is really broadly defined it's not just ethnicity that's that's only a part of culture culture you know you can really think of it as enco encompassing a lot of different things about what makes a person who they are and kind of shapes how they think they generally have a common intergenerational heritage so you know if you were born in the country and raised in the country out in, in you know middle tennessee and you move to new york city it's going to be culture shock there's a reason we call it that um so you've learned over the years and your family has passed on coping skills and tools to deal with this particular culture of you know rural life for example and you don't have the skills and tools to deal with urban life right away you know it takes a little while to get acculturated culture also shares values beliefs customs behaviors traditions institutions arts folklore and lifestyle so thinking about again people that come from different settings and and i use that term kind of broadly uh, who come to where we are and they may be looking around going this is a little odd and we may you know not be as familiar with their background as well they share similar relationship and socialization patterns a common pattern or style of communication or language and this is another one you know think about age groups for example um, youth who grew up communicating by via text um, have a different communication pattern than those of us who grew up before computers were even invented um, and you know they share different languages if you remember and i'm sorry if you know it brings back you know nervous ticks but if you remember the 80s when we we're like oh my gosh like valley girls and everything was like like awesome and totally wonderful um yeah i grew up in the 80s i can't help it uh, <laughs> but that was a whole different communication style and language that drove my mother up the wall totally 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 tubular anyway um the uh so we want to be respectful of that you know are these people interacting in a way that either being standoffish or being you know friendly or you know what their perceptions are or whatever in a way that fits their culture and you know age plays a part in that geographic location of residence we've already kind of talked about and patterns of dress and diet vary you know there are certain cultures of people who have a very regimented um uh diet and and patterns of dress some religions for example don't believe in showing any skin below the neck so being conscious of these sorts of things and you can pick up on a lot of these clues in the initial assessment about what the person's culture is and where they're comfortable um, so when we go through the personality disorder diagnoses 
think to yourself, you know, different times where acculturation or culture may have made someone seem like they might have a personality symptom um, when in actuality it was just a process of acculturation. Cultural issues also can be present when minority groups, immigrants, individuals from different ethnic backgrounds, and those with physical handicaps um, display suspiciousness or guarded or defensive behaviors because they perceive neglect or indifference by the majority of society. So when we're looking at paranoid personality disorder, when we're looking at um, maybe narcissistic or antisocial personality disorder, there are some characteristics that um, someone who is suspicious, guarded, or defensive may project. And we want to say, you know, again, what's the function of that behavior? Where is that coming from? Um, and is it a disorder or is it a protective mechanism that has, you know, sort of helped them survive? Some ethnic groups will also display culturally related behaviors which should not be confused with paranoia avoidance or dependence some cultures are very interdependent and um, there are definitely hierarchical roles in the family gender roles are much different in certain cultures than in others so want to be um, cognizant of those things and in december i'm doing multiple series on several different cultures including um asian american hispanic uh, black and uh, Native American. So, you know, tune in for those if those are any of the cultures that you deal with. Issue number two, stereotyped gender roles. We don't want to misdiagnose a strong, forth, forceful um, female, a, a, a very strong female person as having um, antisocial characteristics. Likewise, if that person adheres to certain um, more traditional gender roles, we also don't want to put them in a uh, category where we're looking at dependent uh, characteristics. So whether or not it's how we think, you know, we would prefer to interact in society, we want to look at the broad scope of what is acceptable in our culture and is it causing the person functional distress. Um, and, and males can often be labeled as antisocial or narcissistic. Again, in our culture, think about CEOs, think about um, heads of organizations, think about uh, sports athletes and people who tend to be very sure of themselves and can be, again, very forceful, sometimes be somewhat manipulative in order to achieve their goals. Well, how do you think they got to be CEO without being confident and kind of all right there. Personality traits are only personality disorders when they're inflective, maladaptive, persistent, and cause functional impairment or subjective distress. Not everybody who has a personality disorder is going to experience subjective distress. And we'll kind of see that mo more in your um, schizoid and schizotypal personality disorders. <clears throat> Issue number three, we want to differentiate mood disorders um, with psychotic features from personality disorders. So paranoid, schizoid, and schizotypal must not have occurred within episodes of schizophrenia, bipolar, or any sort of depressive disorder with psychotic features. So we want to make sure that it's not an enduring mood episode. Personality changes is the result of PTSD. And this is one I hadn't really thought of until I did this pre presentation. But <clears throat> when someone has PTSD, they may lose interest in social relationships where they have that emotional flattening, the detachment, sort of the withdrawal, some solitariness, affect flattening. They can be kind of irritable. They can be cranky. They can have difficulty sleeping, which contributes to mood issues. They can also have, you know, hypervigilance that, strong startle response so they may have some agitation and irritability that goes along with it lack of trust and paranoia you know after you're ex exposed to a trauma of some sort you gotta figure out how that what that means in your world and if 
it's incorporated in some people's world in terms of they see it as um, the world is no longer trustworthy then they're going to exhibit more uh, lack of trust and paranoia um, type symptoms that we want to be dealing with but again this is still ptsd stuff um, and ptsd can be pretty darn enduring it has to be remember acute stress disorder is the first month so month one on is ptsd and some people you know struggle with ptsd for years so it could endure the the right length of time for uh, a personality disorder to meet personality disorder duration criteria but we have to rule out the ptsd because remember i said a lot of people with personality disorders especially um, borderline and in my experience antisocial tend to have been victimized or exposed to trauma significant trauma as children um, so are they expressing ptsd are these personality changes as the result of ptsd or do they have a personality disorder um, issue five and we're going to cover this a little bit more when we talk about diagnosis of addictions but there is such an overlap in the symptoms of addictions and personality disorders i do want to spend a few minutes here um, and i think my my little icon covers this but paranoid schizoid histrionic borderline antisocial and dependent personalities all have a lot of things in common with people with addictions or who are not in recovery um, so let's take a look at that remember that it has been estimated by certain meta-analyses that in the U u.s up to 47 percent of people struggle with addiction at some point in their life and that can include a variety of things sex addiction gambling addiction um uh, you know smoking i believe was also included in there so that you know lumps in a bunch of people in addition to alcohol use and other things but there's a lot of addictive behavior so we want to look at what's common among those addictive behaviors more time is spent getting using and recovering from the substance than intended so the person is sort of preoccupied with this which means they're not paying attention to other things they tend to lose interest in other hobbies um, they may separate and withdraw from other friends and be less concerned about them when somebody is deep in their addiction they are not as interested in social relationships especially not those social relationships which don't share the same addiction um, because you know they don't they're, they're too busy trying to hide their addiction from people who are going to tell them that they're doing things that are bad for themselves um, when somebody is in withdrawal from substances and it could be they're trying to quit or it could be they just haven't had any for a while they could be irritable um, very cranky somewhat aggressive sometimes um, they can be very begrudging and everything is somebody else's fault and they're very resentful towards a lot of people and when people are in withdrawal they also tend to start if you will sobering up and looking around at the chaos that surrounds them either whatever problem they were running from to begin with or all the problems that they've caused because they've been engaging in addictive behaviors for a while and it gets very overwhelming and it's scary as heck for a lot of these people um, so they get angry and they start developing resentments of look what you made me do so this is sort of in the withdrawal period uh, we want to recognize this but once they get past that and develop the coping skills and start weeding through and sorting through the, the rubble that has become their life um, a lot of that tends to go away so you know paranoia or ir irritability while under the influence whether it's marijuana whether it's spice lsd you know there are side effects of a lot of the the um, uh, drugs people can take can make them somewhat paranoid or irritable agitated so just you know again that may not be a personality disorder it may indicate that they're currently under the influence histrionic behaviors can come up overly sexualized behaviors overly dramatic behaviors needing to be the center of attention in order to manipulate others to 
get the substance or to convince them that uh, there's no problem. And when I ran the residential unit, you know, there are periodically people who would come in who were drama creators. And you, you knew when they checked in, um, because we had history with them, that there was going to be some chaos. And a lot of times that chaos was created, that those sort of histrionic behaviors happened, ironically, to take the focus off that person. You know, when things started getting a little hot for them or uncomfortable, they would create some kind of drama in the house and we'd quit looking at them as much because we'd be worried about settling everything down in the house. So these things can also come up in people with addictions. Um, dependence on dealers. You know, some people will be very compliant with their dealers in order to get what they need um, or get the drugs that they think they need. They may fail to meet important role obligations because they're too involved in this drug or, or addiction that, they're, that they've got. Reduction in hobbies or important art activities. When it starts, you know, sometimes the, the high is so good, gambling or, or drugs or sex or whatever it is, that they want to go back. So they, you know, those other hobbies kind of pale in comparison and they focus on that. But after they do it for a while, their neurotransmitters are so far out of whack that in order to even feel normal, they almost have to keep a steady flow of that addictive behavior going on in order to keep their their dopamine levels and everything at a normal at a normal rate so we see them reducing their hobbies and important activities even more in the long run because they need to keep using in order to you know keep going in order to feel even semi-normal um, when they are uh, using you know sometimes they will take on this addiction like it's their best friend and they may continue to use despite knowing it's causing them problems in their life and when this happens they start recognizing that it's causing them problems but they're not ready to let go they can't let go they're afraid to let go whatever it is then they may become hypersensitive to perceived attacks on their character if they think somebody's even judging them even a little bit for their use or even thinking that they're using they start getting very guarded and defensive which causes interpersonal problems um, we start seeing feelings of emptiness and low self-esteem in people who've been especially who've been using for a while they start feeling hopeless and helpless and they you know like when they start to sober up they see that they've hurt people they see what they've done they're like how could i've gotten to this point their self-esteem takes a nosedive for a while and they may start feeling really empty because they see that a lot of things that were important to them, they no longer have. And there's a reluctance to confide in people and doubts of, about people's loyalty because the people who they did trust wanted them to stop using, they wouldn't stop, so those people may have backed off. And then they're like, well, if you're not going to bail me out of jail for the 15th time, you know, then you don't really love me. Um, some of that may be manipulative at some time, but a lot of times people who are, you know, steeped in their addiction actually believe that. They can't see the forest for the trees. And people with addictions can be restless or irritable when not using. If they can't get their substance, they may start pacing the floor and getting really agitated. And this is true whether it's um, something like gambling. You know, if somebody can't go gamble, we will see these same sorts of behaviors. Internet gaming addiction, the same thing. So I don't want you to just focus on drug use. I want you to look at addictions in the bigger picture. Um, and we want to make sure that we're catching those because our behavioral addictions can progress to substance addictions um, when the behaviors, you know, kind of aren't cutting it anymore. We often see people develop additional addictions in drug use you know when people start developing tolerance to one thing they either increase the dose or start combining drugs and sort of making a cocktail in order to enhance the effects same thing's true with behavioral addictions if they're gambling and it's not really doing that doing it for them anymore they may gamble more or they may start combining it with something like cocaine um, to enhance the high 
So we want to pay attention to these things because if we've got somebody who's engaging in problematic use, not even, you know, necessarily meeting diagnostic criteria, um, we want to pay attention to how is that affecting their personality and their social engagements. Autism spectrum disorders is another one that we often see um, underdiagnosed. At, at least I can say I saw it underdiagnosed because in the 15 years I worked in community mental health, I didn't, I didn't see one person come through with any sort of autism spectrum diagnosis. And I know we had people come through that had to, you know, just running the percentages. So people with ASDs, anywhere on the spectrum, you know, we're not going to point out specific ones right now, may have deficits in social-emotional reciprocity, nonverbal communication, relationship skills, and absence of interest in peers, deficits in imaginative play in children, of course, hypo or hyper-reactivity to stimulation. Some people may not be phased at all. Some people may be, you know, just really hyper-stimulated. Insistence on sameness, inflexibility, um, and adherence to routines. And highly restricted fixated interests. So those are the thing, the characteristics of ASDs that overlap with schizoid, antisocial, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So we want to make sure to rule out um, some of those. Differentiate it from FASD. Now, FASD is um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, um, which is in the DSM called neurobehavioral disorder associated with prenatal alcohol exposure. Um, however, whatever you want to call it, it is not in the autism spectrum. So it's a whole different diagnosis, and then the DSM is back in the areas for further study. The... Um, one thing that you want to look at is the fact that people with FASD, and I'm going to call it that for short because it's easier to say than the other, will have an impairment in, in executive functioning, planning, organization, and behavioral inhibition. According to the CDC, people with FASD frequently report a history of the following sexual behaviors, starting with the most prevalent. So, Sexual advances, they have a difficulty interpreting nonverbal communications and respecting other people's space and inhibiting their own behavior. If they want to give you a hug, they're going to give you a hug. So inappropriate touching is very, very common. Um, sexual touching can be very, very common. Promiscuity, exposure, and certain compulsions can also are also very common in people with an FASD. Um, and the web website with the study, whoops, um, is over here. It's, uh, well, you can, you can see the web address if you want to go read the full study that the CDC did. Um, but it shows that there are um, some functioning and impulse control deficits. Now, does it mean that the person is trying to be mean, antisocial, overly sexual, histrionic. No, it means they've got some impulse control issues. Learning, memory, uh, visual spatial reasoning are also problematic in, in persons with FASDs. Mood and behavioral regulation. Attention deficit. Social communication. They may be overly friendly with strangers and have difficulty understanding social consequences. They have difficulty of understanding why it's not okay to just go up and hug a stranger or give somebody a kiss that you've never met before. Daily living skills and motor skills, both fine and gross, may also be impaired in persons with FASD. So we're going to look for some of these other things that are not necessarily common in um, personality disorders. And Alternate conceptualizations. This is another interesting point that came out of the DSM-5. Avoidant personality disorder may just be an alternate conceptualization of social anxiety and phobia. So when you look at how do you differentially diagnose avoidant personality from social anxiety, they couldn't tell you. The DSM was like, they're pretty much the same thing. Um, 
Antisocial and borderline personality disorder criteria can also completely overlap addictive disorders, especially if the addictive behavior began in childhood, that is under 13 years old. Um, because antisocial personality disorder, you have to have the presence of conduct disorder, and a lot of that is before the age of 13. So we want to look and see how long has this behavior been going on. But some people, and, and you know, people with tend to have worse addictions, more severe addictions, may have started using as early as 8, 9, or 10. And that's not uncommon. Um, so let's look at some of the personality disorders and think about how we might differentially diagnose. Paranoid personality disorders, first apparent in childhood, with people being solitary, having poor peer relationships and social anxiety, underachievement in school, and maybe hypersensitive. So this kind of overlaps with um, some other personality disorders we're going to talk about, as well as autism spectrum, fetal alcohol, um, especially in, in, in the early years. Paranoid personality must be present before any psychotic symptoms emerge. So if the person has schizophrenia or, or some other psychotic disorder, the other they must have met the criteria for paranoid personality before those psychotic symptoms emerge. There's the criteria, and you'll see down here it spells out suspect. Suspect of infidelity and dis disloyalty of people. They tend to be unforgiving and be begrudging. Now, this sounds a lot like addiction, people with addictions to me. Suspicious of other people's motives. This sound could sound like addiction it could also sound like um uh, borderline personality disorder perceives and quickly reacts to attacks not apparent to others <clears throat> and suspicion and being highly reactive could also be personality changes as a result of ptsd e as stands for enemy or friend kind of not sure where people stand all the time <clears throat> that's really common in people with borderline personality disorder. Confiding in others is feared. They're, you know, just don't trust anybody. And threats perceived in benign events or remarks. So people can become hypersensitive um, because of trauma experience, because of um, poor acculturation for whatever reason. They may feel like the world is against them they may feel like they're being discriminated against they may be feel begrudging and be suspicious because of poor acculturation um or they're staying with their primary culture or however you want to say it um, so we need to be sensitive to those sorts of things and this is also true remember we said this is also true of people who have um especially physical disabilities can feel like they're not getting what they need. They're not getting their needs met and that society doesn't care to meet their needs. So we want to be sensitive to where, is, where are these behaviors coming from. Schizoid personality. The person has a detached or flattened affect and seems to lack emotion. Now you'll see the acronym here is DISTANT. Seem to lack emotion. They react passively to adverse circumstances. So, you know, they find out they're losing their house. They're like, yeah, whatever. You know, nothing ever gets a rise out of them. They're just blah. Um, they can be, they are indifferent to criticism or praise. Sex is of little interest. Tasks are done solitarily. They tend to have an absence of close friends. And they neither desire nor enjoy close relationships and take pleasure in few activities. Now, they're not introverts. Introverts love relationships. They have a couple of close friends. They don't have 50 best friends. They have a couple of really close friends, and they enjoy close relationships. So it's not that, you know, we want to make sure we differentiate. Is it that they don't have friends because they don't want them? Or um, is it they don't have a whole lot of friends um, and and uh, so anyway we want to differentiate there sex of little interest is another that's kind of one of those beacons that goes off if somebody is um, displaying this trait however 
there are some people who define themselves as asexual. So we don't want to put somebody who is asexual into the schizoid personality area unless they meet the other criteria. So sex of little interest is not in and of itself a problem. Rule out paranoid personality addiction, especially to depressants and opiates, because, you know, people who are on depressants and opiates may seem kind of slow and flat and Honestly, if they're high, they really don't care about criticism or praise. They're just like, yeah, whatever. And sometimes you'll see this on, in people who are uh, heavy users of marijuana. Sex is of little interest, um, absence of close friends. When people are deep in their addiction, especially if it revolves around depressants, um, they may not care about having other friends. It's just about them and, and the drug. Rule out persistent depressive disorder, any psychotic disorders, and autism spectrum disorders. Because again, people with autism spectrum disorder may have difficulty with interpersonal relationships and it, they're overstimulating. So they don't really desire or enjoy them because it's just it's too much to process. Schizotypal. Now the defining features here and the um, acronym or mnemonic is me peculiar. Um, magical thinking and experiences unusual perceptions. So it's very similar to schizoid. However, schizotypal also has the magical thinking and unusual perceptions about what is going on. Paranoid ideation, eccentric, odd behavior, constricted or inappropriate affect, unusual thinking or speech, lacks close friends, ideas of reference, and anxiety in social situations. We want to rule out psychotic and developmental disorders. Um, I can tell you in, in you know, seeing people in, in the facilities that I have, I haven't ever seen someone who met the criteria for schizotypal. It's not that common of a diagnosis. So avoidant personality disorder. We see this a little bit more, and the acronym here is whoops, cringes. Certainty of being liked before getting involved. Um, re rejection preoccupies thoughts. So whenever they're getting ready to get into some sort of relationship or go, go to a meeting or do anything that involves other people, it sort of makes them cringe because they're terrified of rejection and they don't want to let themselves get close to anybody um, unless they're certain it's going to go okay. Intimacy is ref restrained due to fear of getting shamed. Now, some people I work with have high levels of anxiety, um, high levels of fear of rejection, but as soon as they meet somebody, they're just like all in. There are no boundaries. So that kind of differentiates them there. They kind of put it all out there. They're like, here I am, please love me. That's not the avoidant personality. Avoidant personality is very restrained in their initial relationships and with intimacy because they're af afraid of shame um, and they're inhibited in their new relationships. Anytime something comes up where they're going to have to be around others, they try to find a way to get out of it because being around others is just too threatening. Embarrassment prevents trying new activities, new hobbies, and they view themselves as unappealing or inferior. Um, when you're diagnosing this, you also want to rule out body dysmorphic disorder because some people with um, BDD will not want to be in social situations, fear rejection, you know, really meet a lot of these criteria. They can be co-diagnosed if it exists, um, but it's something to be on the lookout for. Dependent personality. Reliance is the mnemonic. Reassurance is required for decisions. Now think about, you know, dependence is somebody who um, is more like a child in their approach to life and constantly needing reassurance, constantly needing approval for decisions. They won't express disagreement because they don't want to be rejected. Um, they want other people to fix it and to take on their life responsibilities. They have difficulty initiating projects. 
They may feel alone, helpless, and uncomfortable if they're alone. They go to excessive lengths to obtain nurturance. Um, companionship of some sort, another relationship, is sought urgently if a close relationship ends. So they don't go from living in mom and dad's house to exploring themselves for a while to a relationship. It's generally from mom and dad's house into a relationship into a relationship. And there's exaggerated fears of being left to care for themselves. An interesting area you want to look at, and, you know, again, I'll bring up the um, culture sort of thing, is when you look at um, the kink, if you want to, what, I can't remember what the acronym is, the appropriate acronym is now, um, for uh, GLBTQ, uh, 2IK, I believe. Um, but K stands for kink. And when you look in the BDSM communities, there are certain um, people who enjoy being submissive and having a parental figure, either a daddy figure or a mommy figure. So, you know, you can do more research if you run into that and you're trying to figure out, is this a personality disorder? Generally, in this situation it's not causing the prob the person problems in their um in their life it's not causing them functional problems and it's not causing them distress it may or may not these behaviors may or may not be separated and just in that one relationship or these behaviors may be more pervasive throughout their life so you know kind of taking that into consideration we also want to differentially diagnose it from separation anxiety. In separation anxiety, um, the focus is specifically on being separated from the attachment figure, you know, mom, dad, primary caregiver. In dependent personality disorder, the attachment and the fear of separation is from anybody. It, it's very indiscriminate. They just need to be in a relationship where somebody's taking care of them. Differentiating it from generalized anxiety, the anxiety and dependent personality is almost exclusively related to fear of being left to care for themselves and not being in a relationship, fears of rejection, more of a social nature. Antisocial personality disorder. The mnemonic is corrupt, conformity to law lacking, obligations are ignored, reckless disregard for the safety of of self or others so it's not just to others it can be to their own self they are just out there and wide open remorse is lacking they can be underhanded deceitful lying manipulative very impulsive and tend to be irritable and aggressive a lot of people with antisocial personality disorder also tend to be um, very confrontational and aggressive when their wishes are blocked because they are going to get what they want, when they want it. Thank you very much. Um, now, in order for this diagnosis to occur, they must have had symptoms of conduct disorder before age 15. Just to review conduct disorder, the person is, uh, before the age of 15, shows aggressiveness, deliberately cruel to other people or animals, property destruction, criminality. They've run away at least twice before the age of 13 and they're truant before the age of 13 so you know antisocial for whatever reason they decided this particular one has to have a um, much more long-standing pattern of behavior but you also want to differentiate differentiate it from addictive disorders we already talked about that and mania or hypomania but specifically mania because people when they're in a manic phase can break laws you know they can be very very impulsive and ignore their obligations they are wide open they're you know people in a manic phase often are not paying attention to you know staying on schedule they often have a reckless disregard for safety of self and others um they may be impulsive irritable and aggressive now a lot of times in a manic episode people still have remorse but not always you know sometimes they're just not even in touch with their feelings at that point um, so you want to look, remember, manic episodes are going to be episodic, and personality disorder is going to be two years. So 
that's one of the defining features there borderline personality um, one of my favorites to talk about um, the mnemonic is am suicide and when you've worked with someone that has borderline personality disorder um, you generally have have an idea um, they have fears of abandonment mood instability and marked reactivity of mood they can have suicidal self or self-mutilating behavior so you know cutting falls into this category it doesn't just have to be um uh, suicidal and in some cases um some people have tried to make the argument that people who have multiple plastic surgeries in order to try to get approval and love and you know that kind of stuff because of their um maybe body dysmorphia or whatever it is sometimes that's included but again we want to look at culture and our culture is very pro plastic surgery in a lot of ways so would that be considered not culturally sanctioned unstable and intense relationships with a person with borderline personality disorder um, relationships you never know if you're going to have dr jekyll or mr hyde walk out of the bedroom and it can you can be in the middle of a conversation and things are going well and they the person with bpd perceives that they're being judged or attacked and they will turn on a dime and you will go from being the most revered to the most hated um, which makes it really difficult for anyone around some someone who has borderline personality because they don't pick up on these perceived slights so they don't know and they're always walking on eggshells to quote the book trying not to um, set the person off impulsivity in two potentially destructive areas now i have an asterisk besides this beside this because it tends to be one of the more defining features of borderline um, control of anger is really difficult for the person with borderline personality as soon as they feel attacked they start lashing out um, identity disturbance dissociative or paranoid symptoms and chronic feelings of emptiness okay so if it's overdiagnosed, then what are we missing what are we calling borderline personality disorder when it should be something else we want to rule out major depression in major depression people have feelings of guilt and worthlessness emptiness suicidal ideation and mood lability which you know all of which you see in people with borderline personality disorder so even remember depression can start in early childhood it doesn't have to start you know later on in life like it does for a lot of people not everybody has that you know blessing if you will of not having it start till later in life we want to rule out mania erratic aggressive behavior impulsivity and mood instability are all common in mania so those unstable and intense relationships impulsivity control of anger um, those may be present during a manic episode and anxiety we want to rule out generalized anxiety disorder which also can cause mood instability when somebody's anxious a lot of the time they may be very irritable they may be you know angry one minute and then like they try to calm themselves down they may be impulsive have anger issues because remember anger and fear are two sides of the fight or flight so if somebody's really anxious all the time they may lash out um sort of in a protective self-preservatory way um, and stress rel related paranoid symptoms are not uncommon in people with generalized anxiety disorder so let's look at what's going on because both uh, major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder can be long long on uh, long standing ongoing issues mania is going to be more episodic but we need to look at differentially diagnosing can borderline and depression or borderline and anxiety occur together yes they can um, they can 
To differentially diagnose, we want to rule out addictive disorders, depression, anxiety, but also intermittent explosive disorder, bipolar, paranoid personality, antisocial, and dependent personality. Common co-occurring issues, according to the DSM, um, depression, anxiety, bulimia, and PTSD. Bulimia is really common in borderline um, personality disorder. PTSD is also really common co-occurring. Now, if we go back to one of those first issues, remember, we don't want to misdiagnose some personality changes as a result of PTSD as a personality disorder. Um, we need to look and see chicken egg kind of what's going on here. I personally, and, you know, I'm not making recommendations. I'm just, you know, throwing out there um, self-disclosure. I personally tend to steer away from personality disorder diagnoses most of the time, um, unless it's just really right out there. Um, because personality disorders are perceived to be enduring things that are relatively untreatable um, or highly difficult to treat and there are a lot of agencies that will not unfortunately accept patients who have a personality disorder diagnosis um, and you say well how can they do that because they argue that someone with a personality disorder needs a higher level of care than they can provide um, especially at your residential and intensive outpatient levels which means a person with a personality disorder, you know, may be referred up for, you know, inpatient hospitalization before they need to, may need to meet the criteria for inpatient hospitalization before they can actually get any sort of enduring treatment. So their issues have to get really severe or they're in once a week outpatient or maybe three times a week outpatient, um, which isn't enough for them. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I personally, um, you know, unless I have just really huge mounds of evidence that a personality disorder exists, at least in the first, you know, couple months that I'm working with somebody, I try to let everything, the dust settle and figure out where we are before I even entertain the idea of a personality disorder diagnosis. Prevalence of borderline personality. Now, remember I said approximately... 15% um, of the United States population meets the criteria for a personality disorder diagnosis. In the United States, the pre prevalence of borderline is 6% in primary care, 10% in mental health, and 20% in psych hospitals. So again, that kind of supports what I was just saying, that a lot of times a person gets to the point or can't get into any program until they meet the criteria for being in a psych hospital. But you also have the fact that people with borderline personality disorder often engage in self-destructive and self-injurious behaviors that can get them into that place quicker. Nearly 50% of individuals with a uh, borderline personality disorder diagnosis in early adulthood do not meet criteria 10 years later. Let that set in for a minute. That was a new tidbit that I learned doing this class. 50% of people with borderline personality disorder in early adulthood do not meet criteria 10 years later. So then was it person borderline personality disorder? Um, is it something that's enduring? Or are personality disorders easier to treat than we are thinking they are? I don't know. Many adolescents and young adults display borderline characteristics as they develop identity, adjust to independence, and resolve existential conflicts. Who am I going to be when I grow up? What do I stand for? What's right? What's wrong? All that kind of stuff. And if you've worked with adolescents or you've had brothers or sisters or teenage children, you've seen this. And there are some days you're just kind of looking at them going, oh my gosh, you know, bless your heart. Um, but recognizing that they're struggling with a lot of stuff and i mean heavy stuff uh, that people our age would be considering heavy stuff but hopefully you know we've gone through and already answered a lot of those questions for ourselves but they're young and they're you know optimistic and trying to figure out what makes the world work histrionic tends to be provocative or sexually seductive relationships are often more considered more intimate than they are 
They thrive on attention and are very uncomfortable when they're not the center of attention. They can be influenced easily. Now, these are all really common characteristics of fetal alcohol spectrum as well. The style of speech can be impressionistic or lack detail. Um, emotions may be rapidly shifting and shallow. They may have a made-up physical appearance to draw attention to themselves. And they tend to be pretty exaggerated and theatrical in their emotions. So we want to differentially diagnose, figure out um, what the motivation behind these behaviors is, are. And, you know, if people are seeming to not learn from their experiences, they keep doing the same, making the same mistake, having the same consequences and not, you know, getting it. I would really encourage looking at fetal alcohol spectrum issues. Narcissistic personality disorder, special. They believe themselves to be unique. They are preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. They tend to feel entitled. They're often very grandiose in their sense of self-importance and conceited. And their sense of self-importance and grandiosity is what differentiates narcissistic personality disorder from a lot of the other ones. Um, they are not afraid of interpersonal exploitation. You know, that's true in antisocial too, but in narcissistic, you, you have that, you know, larger than life sort of, I am all that and six bags of chips. They tend to be arrogant and lack empathy. You want to differentially diagnose with psychotic disorders, especially those that have delusions of grandeur, antisocial personality, and again, that manic episode comes back. And finally, obsessive compulsive disorder. The person loses the point of the activity due to preoccupation with detail. They have difficulty completing tasks because they're too perfectionistic. They have difficulty discarding worthless objects. Their friendships are often excluded to a pre due to a preoccupation with work. They're inflexible, scrupulous, and over-conscientious on ethics, values, or morality, which is not accounted for by religion or culture. One of those people who's by the book, and this is the way it's got to be. Reluctance to delegate unless others submit to exact guidelines. This is how it has to be done. They can be miserly toward themselves and others and very stubborn and, and rigid. Um, if you've ever watched the TV show Monk, um, they did a very good... Um, character development of someone with obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Um, you want to differentially diagnose with autism spectrum, social anxiety, schizoid personality, obsessive compulsive disorder, where the person has true obsessions. They're thinking about something like germs or the, the stove is on, and they have a true obsessive compulsive interaction there, and hoarding disorder. So, Personality disorders represent a long-standing and pervasive pattern of behavior which causes impairments in psychosocial functioning. It has to cause impairments first, not necessarily distress, but it, or distress. So even if it's not causing impairments, if it's causing the person distress for some reason, then we're still looking at it meeting the criteria as long as it's been at least two years. Many people with uncontrolled mood and or psychotic disorders may display symptoms resembling personality disorders. So we want everything else to shake out first before we start looking at personality disorders. For a personality disorder to be diagnosed, the other conditions must be brought into remission and or the pattern of personality disordered behavior existed before the onset of the mood or psychotic features, which, you know, you may be going way back. You may not even have a historian who can go back that far reliably for you. Many treatment centers have restrictions against admission of persons with personality disorders, asserting they need a higher level of care. But then those people, once they get out of psychiatric hospitals, where do they step down to? Because, again, the person with a personality disorder is often treated, unfortunately, more like the hot potato. So as a profession... I think we need to look at some of the research that shows that, you know, sometimes, you know, 10 years later, 50% of people with borderline personality disorder no longer meet the criteria. So what is that telling us? Um, and what new treatments, what best practices like DBT do we have that we can help 
uh, people with personality disorders develop the skills and tools they need to go into remission, if you want to say that, um, with the personality disorder. Okay. Well, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, we have completed our presentation on personality disorders. Does anybody have any questions? That data I gave you at the beginning of class is not on the quiz. Um, it, it's not, you know, information that I think is crucial to helping you make effective diagnoses. I just thought it was really interesting um, how it broke down and that borderline personality disorder wasn't even in the, you know, top five. Alrighty. Well, I really appreciate you guys being here today, and I will see you on Tuesday. Have an amazing weekend, and, you know, hope everybody starts getting ready for Turkey Day. If you enjoy this podcast, please like and subscribe, either in your podcast player or on YouTube. You can attend and participate in our live webinars with Dr. Snipes by subscribing at allceus.com slash counselor toolbox. This episode has been brought to you in part by allceus.com, providing 24-7 multimedia continuing education and pre-certification training to counselors, therapists, and nurses since 2006. Use coupon code counselor toolbox to get a 20% discount off your order this month.